Or unless it lets the whiteboard. I hope this works. Can y'all everybody see that? Oh, <laughs> what? Is, what? Oh, why did, you just why did I just? <laughs> yes, that was a whiteboard. Okay, now I'm trying to make it full screen. I accidentally X out of it. Yeah, man. Okay. So, actually, I'm going to type this out first. Okay. You're going to type it out? Yeah, because I feel like I can type out the first part. You can also just explain it in words for the most part. Oh, okay. So, but, okay. So I don't have to write it out. Unless people feel like they really need you to. Um, and I can help write some if we need it. Because I actually have a way to write with a pencil versus. Okay. Liz. I think that might be. Well, you could always... Did somebody say something? And then there's a whiteboard. It was no, too much. a pencil somewhere. No, Liz, go ahead. I think your mom just took it. Ugh. I didn't ask her attitude, Rahan, but thanks. Oh, oh she my did. gosh. Oh, I can ask her for it. She's on YouTube. Okay. So we have to find the period, the amplitude, and the phase shift. Like, uh, we kind of learned last year, like you said in the video. But um, so to find the period, it's 2 pi over b. OK, 2 pi over b, once again. And so for us, oh. oh we have it? Yes. Yay. Okay. Okay. Where is it? It's not a stylus, so it does not work. Okay, so in this case, your B is? Our B is? Huh? B is three? For one in six O? Yes. I thought it was one. No. No? Okay, no. well, I guess it's two pi over three now. There always was. <laughs> how, you how, to, know that, how do you, you, know have, to, you have to distribute the three? Oh, that's that's smart. It's rad, dude. So it would become like in the parentheses you have so you have five sine of oh, three, three X. X plus pi over four. I don't know why the brackets are kind of Wait, throwing why me is off. Pi over twelve. That's the you have to distribute the three. So it would be three pi over 12, which is pi over four. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. okay, going Liz. Now you can use this information. You still got it. You got it, girl. Okay, okay. So your amplitude is A, which is in the beginning. So that's five. Okay, that is five. That's your amplitude. And then for your phase shift, I was kind of confused on this. I watched a video, but they say you just make the middle portion equal to zero. So I guess now that you've, um, what's it called, expanded it or factored it out or whatever. So it just be 3x um, plus pi over four. And then you set that equal to zero. And I just did not solve it. You can do that really quickly. because so I just did it wrong before. So 3x plus pi over four equals zero, and you have like three x plus pi equals negative four, and then you have like x plus oh pi uh, equals negative four over three. Is that that? The phase shift you're trying to find? Huh? What are you trying to find? The phase shift. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, I guess I have x equals negative four minus pi over three, whatever that is. Uh, right now. <laughs> Don't give me that face, Rohan. Is that not correct? I mean, it, the, the face shift is pi over 12. What? Okay. <laughs> I swore I had this in the bag, too. Liz, Wait, Liz, why wouldn't it be pi over 4? No, Liz, I understand what you did. When you do it, you have 3x plus 4 is equal to 0, right? Yeah. And you get 3x is equal to negative pi over 4. Uh-huh. Divide by three, so you get negative pi over. Oh, four. yeah. Okay, I see. I just did it wait, a different way. Wait, wait, that wait, makes sense. Okay, so you equal this mm -hmm. to zero, correct? Mm -hmm. So we have three x. You just move this over the pi over four over, right? Mm -hmm. So you have negative pi over four, and then divided by three is when you get the pi over twelve. Okay. Yeah. Okay, then that makes sense. Well, I guess I have the other one in the bag then because that one was the last. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. The other one was less complicated. Uh, did you say what the maximum and minimum were? 
Ooh, I did not do that. Okay, so when you um when you're trying to figure out the maximum and minimum values, you're just trying to find the um like when you plug in where your maximums and minimums would be for a sine function. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for this one, you end up, according to the book, now mind you, this book is riddled with errors, um, okay. and I did not make an answer key myself this time, but it is six is the max, and the min is negative four. Okay. Okay, so now you can do B. Okay, and wait, so that's, how do we have, wait, 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 say that for me one more time? The max Maximum. is six, and then the min is negative, negative four, or just four? Negative four. Yeah, negative no, four. Oh, she, it's just in the book. I don't, like, it's four. You can graph it and find your max and mins. That's one way to find it. Okay. Can I have a question? Yeah. Could you also just do one minus five and one plus five? Like, you take the D and yes. the, is that? Um, you can also go from your midline. So think about your graph. This is your midline. To and then you have your max and your min. And then this is the amplitude. So that's what um, Rohan was saying. Oh. So if you have right now, our value is at one. And then we have minus five to go down, which would be negative four. Uh -huh. That's our minimum. And then you have plus five to go up. And that's what gives you six. That's your maximum. Oh. Okay, part B. Okay. No. I don't know if you, if you want to write it out, that's fine. But it's negative two cosine of three X plus five pi over two minus two. I was trying to write out, but you get the gist, I guess. And so your period is two pi over B and your B in this situation is three X so your period is two pi over three. Oh, three, 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 not three X. I apologize, but um, yes, okay. And your amplitude is what's in front, so that's negative two, again. And then your phase shift, that is, oh wait, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I just make the middle equal to zero, so that's three X plus five squared, what? Yes, five pi over two. Set that equal to zero. And I got x equals negative pi, negative five pi over three. Uh, Ms. Thompson? Yeah. Can you explain why we are doing three x plus five pi over two equals zero? Um, so when, yeah, when you set, when you're trying to find the phase shift, you're setting the center equal to zero is the phase shift. Oh, we're trying to find a phase shift for yes. that. Oh. Mm -hmm. And Liz, it's over six. Because okay, you already had the denominator that. two and three. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Never mind. Uh, your maximum and minimum values happen to be the same for this one. It's okay. six and negative four. We've already been over how to find those, so we're not going to do it again. Um, moving on to question two. Okay. Cool beans. Who had the first number two? <laughs> oh, shoot. Oh, my gosh. Wait, did we, what did you say about the maximums for that one? Sorry. It was the same. It's six and negative four. Okay. Who has number two? I do. I do. Okay. Ooh. Alrighty. Yeah, you gotta move faster. Yes. All right, so the voltage B produced by an AC generator is given by this formula, this well, not formula, but this function, basically. And it says, what is the maximum voltage produced? So I found the maximum by just graphing it. Um, and that is 220 volts um, right here. And then I also you know, I graphed it so I could see the minimum as well. Um, that's that's supposed to be a negative right here, negative negative 220. Sorry, I didn't put it that. Um, but then it asks, what is the amplitude of the function V? And to find amplitude, um, 
all I had to do was um, max minus the min divided by two. And that's how I got 220V again. Yep. And then for part D, it says, what is the period of the function V? And to find period, you remember, just as Liz was talking about, two pi over B. So we have two pi, and then the B is 120 pi, and then equals one over 60. Yep. And then finally, for E, E, all they're asking is you to sketch the graph of you over two periods. So all you had to do was just sketch the graph, but I already had it here, so. So technically, based off of that last question, E, I would predict that this would have been a non-calculator question. I'm fine with the fact that you use your calculator, but just for those of you that are curious of how you would have found the first two answers um, without a calculator, there's no vertical shift. So your maximum is always going to be your amplitude if there's no vertical shift. So our amplitude was 220, which we got from the A value. Uh, so that's just if you don't have a calculator. Okay, if you, is the amplitude uh, just the thing in front of, it's the thing in front of the sine or cosine and everything? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, number three, who had it? That would be me. All right, Leonard. Okay, so um, how can I do a whiteboard? Um, uh, you screen, share screen, and then there's one that's a whiteboard. Oh, there, I see it. All right. All right, um, maximize this. Okay, so... I tried. Um, not sure if it went well, but we'll see. Okay, so uh, the question asks about the uh, height of the water tides. So for number A, I um, actually decided to kind of uh, sketch it out and to kind of uh, see where it went and uh, where I got the um, max, I got the uh, amplitude. So, um, the A, yep. Um, so we got the A of, uh, so, uh, 6.6, .6, um, which I got by doing, um, four, uh, 14.4 minus 1.2, um, yeah, over two, um, which is then equal to 13.2 over two, which is then equal to 6.6. .6. Um, yeah, so then B, uh, I found, well, actually, well, I'm not done yet. Oops, sorry. Um, I am, well, oh, actually, yeah, oh, sorry, because, like, I had to, I have to find, yeah, sorry, I was, I, I just confused myself right there. Okay, whatever. Um, so, uh, for the next, uh, letter, I, um, just, uh, simply looked, um, at, uh, like, I kind of guessed for this one because I was unsure on how to do it. But um, I said, since we're only calculating one uh, full wave at the end of the game, it's essentially just going to be two pi. Um, yeah. Um, so for this one, the, the period that they give you, when they say the consecutive high tides is 12 hours, so um, B would be equal to be two pi divided by 12 which in this case is pi over six. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm gonna actually write that down here. Um, okay, pi over six, okay. That, well, that changes a lot of my answers, but uh, I'll just have okay. to go with that. Um, okay, so uh, next up, C is, uh, I found this by, uh, uh, plugging everything. Actually, I need to uh, plug in D first because with, uh, I can't do C without D. So, um, all right. Yeah. It, so right, since this is a sine function, um, where would it normally have a high tide? At which value? 14.4. Yes, it, sorry, at what X value? Oh, uh, at uh, eight uh, point uh, one fourth, I guess, at eight hours and fifteen minutes. Yeah, so that would be eight point two five is where it happens now. 
Um, but normally it should happen on our, just like a sign graph before it's been moved, it would happen at um, pi over two. Oh, okay, right, right. Um, so then uh, based off of that, from the shift from pi over two to um, our uh, new time of 8.25, um, your value change for D is, according to the book, 7.8 meters. Yes, that's what I got. That's what I got. Yes. Awesome, Leonard. All right. Um, cool. So for uh, C, I then essentially just plugged everything into the equation. Um, uh, keep in mind, these uh, values are now slightly off since uh, I just figured out that it's pi over six, but uh, here we go anyway. So um, uh, here we have uh, 14 point four um, is equal to it's is equal to set six point uh, six um, all right six point six then sine um, of uh, two uh, pi and then uh, next parentheses is then eight and then uh, one fourth of an hour, so eight one fourth. I just wrote plus c brackets close, and then plus seven point eight. I hope that's correct. Yes. Yeah, so now with those new numbers, since I can go ahead and give you guys that value, um, it should be um, negative five point two five is your c value. Uh. Okay, so you can get negative. So I got that. that okay, I got. Okay, well, I might. The value would be different because you have the two pi instead of the pi over six. Yeah, because my answer right now is four point oh oh eight. That's how. But, yeah. yeah. So it's different because of that. All right. So then part B is to just plot it and figure out where the first low tide is. Um, and so, you know that the low tide value is one point two. So now you have these A, B, C, D values. You would set 1.2 equal to your new formula and solve for X. Okay, that's what I did. Um, obviously with the two pi, so my values are gonna be slightly off, but with the two pi, I got negative 1.9573, which is gonna be a different value because I have my wrong values in here. But um, and in this case, it comes out to be X is um, 2.25. Yeah. Uh, okay. So does that make sense to everyone? The, the part that I just said out loud of sort like, of. you plug in your A, B, C, D values to that function and set it equal to 1.2. So you would have 1.2 is equal to 6.6 .6 sine pi over six times X minus 5.25 plus 7.8. Yep, and because I got my uh, two pi, uh, my my pi value wrong, um, I also got my c wrong. So therefore, my my equation is, is essentially double wrong. But um, okay, so for question C, the way you would do it, they're only allowed to leave the harbor if the height of the water is at least five meters. So you have to find the times where it's above five meters. So your graph would look something like this. And you're finding all of the values where it's above five oh. meters. So you should have a couple intervals where that happens. And the two intervals, if you graph it, and then you find these values where you can graph the function and then graph the value y equals five of y equals five meters, find the intersections, and that will give you these values. And that will tell you your intervals. Does that make sense, everyone? Can you yeah. repeat? Yep, I read the question. Yeah. So you're, the question is asking you for when the boats can only leave when it's above five meters. So if I have in my y equals, I could do um, y1 equals the function that we just found. And then y2 equals 5. And then you do second calc intersect. 
and that'll give you these values here. You can find each of these. And so between these are the values where the intervals where it's above five meters. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, I uh, essentially did an equation for it. Um, wouldn't you essentially just do uh, plug in the five where you pl where we plugged in the 1.2 earlier, so? You could, yes. That okay. would be doing it by hand, but your calculator will do it faster. Ms. Right. Thompson, can you explain how you found C and D again? I kind of got lost there. Yeah. So for C, okay, let me start with D because you have to find D first. Okay. Um, so in order to find D, normally your sine function will cross at zero and the first maximum on your original sine graph, like if you look at your notes, this normally happens at the value pi over two, right? Yeah. Or is it, yeah, pi over two. Mm -hmm. Okay, but on our graph, it tells us that the maximum happens at 14.4, yeah. No, no, that would be the y value of the maximum. Oh, wait. But the x value that it happens at, it says on a particular day, the first high tide occurs at 8.15, which if it's at 8.15, that's the value 8.25. Okay. So you just have to figure out how much did it move to get from pi over 2 to 8.25, and that would be 7.8. Yep. And then to yeah. find D. Now um, to find D, or to find C, you're going to plug in your D value, and you're going to plug in the point. So it gave you 14.4 is the first maximum, and it occurs at 8.25 is the time. So I plugged in those values. We'd already found our A and our B, and that means that the only variable I have left to solve for is C. Oh, and then you just solve. I just solve. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did, I actually found a D by doing 14.4 uh, plus 1.2 over 2, uh, which is then equal to 7.8. That also works. What's up, Nock? Um, so is it going to be 8.25 or 8.15? Because I saw it in the question is saying 8.15. So it's 8.25 because 8. 15, 15 is out of 60 minutes. Oh, right. So that's only 0.25 or one quarter of an hour. So that's why it's oh, right. Okay, um, Rohan, you're up. All right, I'm gonna stop screen share. I feel like for mine it'd be easier if I just shared the sheet, don't you think? Yeah, that's fine. Cool, okay. Um, they also do, um, these questions on delta math. So if you just want to explain like A, E, and F. A, E, and F? Yeah. Okay. Um, so for A, uh, so your A value, okay, wait, I'm gonna get there. Okay, so your A value is your amplitude, right? So you find the midline, which is like, I can't draw, but you, you can see it. It's too small. Um, so you get 0.5 because it's at uh, the amplitude. You get 0.5 because the difference between the um, like min and max is one, and then you divide it by two. So you get a 0.5. And this is a cosine graph, right, Ms. Thompson? Yeah. Uh, this one is cosine, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it's a cosine graph. Um, and then you find the period because, so the period is two pi, because um, that's when it completes the complete revolution. But to find the B term, you do you divide 2 pi by B, right? So 2 pi divided by 2 pi is just 1. So you just have X. Um, and then the midline is at negative 3. So that's your D term. And then that's it. Does everybody get that? Okay, I'll zoom you, I'll do it. Okay. Um, should I just do F, E and F then? E and F, yeah. Okay, so for E, um, just looking at like the things we have on the notes, right? It's obvious that this is a tangent function. Um, and because the asymptotes are equally distanced apart, um, there, there's like, there's no period, right? 
Is that, a, is that how we explain to Ms. Thompson? Uh, say it again, sorry. That the, because the asymptotes are like equally spaced out, there's no um, period, right? That is the period, is how far apart your asymptotes are. Yeah, and right now it's like, it's, it's the same as a regular one, so it's a regular tangent function. Um, and then- Wait, 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 can you explain that? Like, what do you mean by like, oh, it's a regular tangent function, so this is this. Like, okay, I'm trying to zoom in, give me a second so y'all can see, okay. So see how the asymptotes are like, do you see what the asymptotes are, like these dotted lines? Mm -hmm. So the distance between them is, I'm trying to figure out, it's pi, right, Ms. Thompson? Uh, yeah, sure. It's about pi. So that's like the distance. <laughs> that's like how it is on a regular tangent function. So because of that, it, there's like no shift in like the distance between the asymptotes, so your period is the same. I don't know if I explained that correctly. So that if, if the period changed on this graph, then the dotted lines, instead of being pi apart, like the original graphs on your notes, um, instead it would be like from here would be, uh, let me, so like instead your lines would be looking more like this and your asymptotes would be spread apart. It like gets more flat in the middle instead of this really steep line right here. Does that make sense? Keep going, Rohan. Um, so then you sorry. So then you have X, right? And then there is a uh, phase change in it. Um, and it's minus pi over four. Um, because like if you I'm trying to see I'm trying to like how do I explain it, Miss Thompson? Like Yes or no, she said. Where I get lost. Well, normally, this tangent function, let me use a color other than blue because the line is blue. Um, this part of the function right here normally crosses through the origin. Yeah. So it shifted to the right, um, pi over four. And so that's your phase shift is your horizontal shifts. Because usually, like, the blue line would be at zero, like at the origin, but it didn't cross that, so... So your phase shift would be minus pi over four. So it would be x minus pi over four. And then tangent, um, and that's it. Yeah. There's no vertical shift in it. Um, and then the next one is secant, uh, f. So it matches like the drawings that we have here on our notes. Um, and so this one, the period is uh, one over two. Right, um, and it's like x, so, just like it's secant one half x plus one, um, like that would just be like the overall formula. Um, I'm trying How to figure far apart are the asymptotes on the original graph, Rohan? Can you explain that? I, I didn't hear you cut out. On the original graph, how far apart are the asymptotes for secant? Uh, on the original graph, they are like high apart, I think. And then what are they on this one? two pi apart. So since they're two pi apart, um, that's the same thing as doing a horizontal stretch by one half. So that's where we get our one half x. So secant one half x. Okay, keep going. Um, and then there's a plus one because usually on the secant, um, like it, the, the secant is usually at one, like uh, as a regular function. So because it's at two, uh, you get plus one. Your midline shifted up one, so. Yeah, your midline. One. What was the function for A again? It was uh, cosine. Okay. Okay, uh, who had the first one for the second section? I did. Okay, go ahead, Bella. Um, I mean, I feel like this one revolves a lot around like the unit circle. Mm -hmm. So like, can, I'm just gonna do the same thing as Rohan and share the the notes, I guess, because I wrote mine on paper. Sure. I mean, for a lot of these, I just kind of looked at the unit circle, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like the arc sign, it would be like known as the sine inverse, I'm pretty sure. And so what you would do is you would look at the unit circle for um, sine of one half, which is like pi over six and like 
on the unit circle that would equal 30 degrees, right? Yes. There's one other value. Yeah. I Okay. It's 150 degrees, right? Because it's. Yeah, I think it, five pi over six. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, I, I do radians, not degrees. Um, well, well, I mean, at, well, because let me double check and make sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's I'm pretty right. sure you're right. The, the reason why what we're talking about is when you have one half on the unit circle, sine is your y coordinate. And there are two places, you're right, Bella. Um, okay. There are two places where you have the sine value being positive and it's here and here. So right. the first value was pi over six, which means this one is five pi over six. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so for B, um, it's the tan inverse of one, which um, basic, I found it to be pi over four, but this one does require like a little more math because what you would have to do is you would have to find tangent by doing the sine over cosine and see like what on the unit circle, like when you d divide um, so the sine by cosine, which one would give you one. And I, but I found that to be pi over four. It is. Um, so you have pi over four would give you normally square root two over two divided by square root two over two. And that would give you one. Um, so in order to keep that um, value positive. It's at pi over four. It's also at five pi over four. Uh, and the reason why is because then at five pi over four, it's negative divided by a negative. Ms. Thompson, I thought the tan inverse would be cosine over sine because sine over cosine is. Sine over cosine is tangent. Yeah. So tan so... inverse is sine over cosine. You're talking about cotangent, which is the reciprocal function. Oh, uh, I see. Reciprocal means to flip the fraction. Inverse means to undo. I'm, I'm kind of confused. You use the unit circle to find all this? Yes. Yeah. It looks so, this is one of those where like it looks really hard, but you really just kind of have to like remember the unit circle or have it in front of you. Can you like pull up a unit circle and show one? Like, yeah. Okay, I guess that's, yeah, that's the so answer. So on the, uh, let's do not the last one we looked at. Let's do the next one. So the next question was um, the cosine inverse of negative one. So you're going to find where cosine, remember cosine is, it's cosine comma sine when you have your coordinates. Yeah. Which you find the place where the x coordinate cosine would be negative one. Which is, which right is at pi or 180. And that's the only place where that one happens. So that's all you have to do. Oh, but, like, yeah. That's um, it. So the next one was, um, where is the tangent one over the square root of three? So remember, that's going to be your y value divided by your x value because it's sine divided by cosine. And we want it to be one divided by square root of three. Um, I think I found that to be pi over six. Um, yeah, pi over six and seven pi over six. Yeah. So like for a lot of them, yeah, a lot for a lot of them, there are like the two possible values. And the reason why there's two possible values is just because of your signs. So this one is square root three, um, is one half divided by square root three over two. When you look at seven pi over six, it's just the negative values. It's the same thing, but a negative divided by a negative, which we know still gives us a positive. So that's why there's two values. Okay, I got that. Um, okay. What's the next one, Ms. Thompson? Um, the next one is uh, the arc sine of zero. So you're finding where the y coordinate is zero. Right, which would be both of these. So, so you have zero and pi and two pi. Yeah, um, so your even though values are two pi and zero are the same thing, you have to write it twice because they're technically not the same thing. One is after you've gone around the circle once. Right. Yeah. So 
would it be zero degrees and 180 degrees as the two possible then? Or would it and be? And 360 degrees. And 360, okay. Yeah, it's three values. Um, and then the next one is the um, arc cosine of one over the square root of two. So for, right? Yeah. yeah. So for this one, what I did is I just rationalized it just to make it easier. So I just multiplied it by like the numerator by the square root of two and the denominator by the square root of two. And I got the square root of two over two, which is, um, and the co we see that in the cosine value both in pi over four and in three pi over four. Uh, so, no, in pi right. over four and in five, uh, and oh. in seven pi over four. You know, I even wrote that. I just didn't say it. <laughs> oh. Ms. Thompson? Yes. Ms. Thompson, is there delta math on this? Um, I think so. Maybe not exactly like this. Okay, because I just feel like when I go through delta math, like, I figure out how to do it. Like, yeah, right now, I, can, just, like, I can double check if there isn't, and I can add something like this. Um, if you'd like. Sorry, Rohan. I mean, like, you just do it for me, but, um, what? <laughs> so the, yeah, so the two possible values are 45 degrees and 315 degrees. And then okay. the last, yeah. The last one is negative one half, which y'all should have this pattern roughly down by now. Sorry, Jacqueline. Uh, Bella, you're done. Who had number two? Me. Go ahead, Tomas. I'm gonna mute mine. So you Thompson, can you uh, explain real quick what is the arc? Is it going to be the, the sine? Inverse. It's just another way of writing the sine negative one. Oh. Okay. Okay. So. <laughs> Ow. Um, dang it, where did my sheet of paper go? It's right here, okay? Um, so, I need the volume. Okay. So I got the problem uh, sine, um, where's the button? Inverse of uh, x is equal to um, two, let's just say pi, okay, two pi divided by nine, right? Okay, and so what you do is, so in order to get rid of a uh, inverse sine, you have to take the sine of both sides. So that turns out to be um, sine of uh, two pi divided by nine is going to be equal to x, and so x is equal to zero point zero four two eight. No nope, eight. And then you plug in that value to find the cosine inverse. Where's the one? Inverse of x. And you just plug in the x there, and then you get 0 0.873, and that's it. Good job. Um, uh, Going on yourself, I'll meet myself. Well, you're, um, you're skipping the your problem because you didn't do it, right, Jacqueline? Yeah, yes. Um, so you need to get your problem done for your classmates and send them a video. Um, but I'm recording this so you can go to your meeting. Okay. Um, who has number four? I did. All right. Are you Mikel right now? I just saw that. You're so silly. Yeah. All right, Andrew. Alrighty. Whiteboard shared. If, and that goes for, sorry, really quickly, Andrew, that goes for anybody. Um, if you can't stay any longer, um, I am recording this. So really the only people that have to have to stay are Andrew and Knock. you have number five, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go for A. You're supposed to see if you can find the inverse of f of x and g of x. I may have gotten this wrong, but uh, f of x is the um, sign, or uh, I'll do text. That's much easier. Okay. So the equation is uh, f of x equals sine of 2x. Um, the inverse of sine is a uh, 
cosecant and transferring the two to the other side, it would be one half cosecant x. Is that correct? No, unfortunately not. What you gave was the reciprocal. Remember when we're doing inverse functions, you have to switch your y's and x's. So this would become um, x is equal to sine of 2y. And then how do you move the sine to the other side? You do sine inverse. So you would have sine inverse of x. Oh, I overthought it. Though. Is equal to 2y. And then y is equal to sine inverse of x divided by 2. Oh. Okay, so I, I, I just overthought that, okay. Um, and then g of x, what would that one be then? Um, uh, g of x is um, one half x, so I, I didn't put y for that. So what I, I just put y for this then. Yeah, and then. And then transfer it to the other side, which would be two y equals g of x. Yep, so you have g inverse of x is equal to 2x. Because when you need to move the one half to the other side, you multiply both sides by 2. Okay. So. And then for b, um, you're supposed to find a uh, domain is now restricted to 0 is less than or, um, or yeah, 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to pi over two, and then find the inverse, uh, g negative one. So g would now be um, one equal, one half equals um, one half, one half. Uh, it's g inverse, so it would be 2 times 1 half. Oh, okay. 2 times 1 half, uh -huh. which would then equal just 1. So um, is that all you have to do? Or? That's the first one, and then you do um, this one is f. In oh, yeah, okay. And then that one is um, f inverse of g pi of six, so, uh, well, let me just do that. G pi over six equal to um, half uh, pi over six, and multiplying that together, would that be, um, would that just be pi over 12? Yep. Okay. Pi over 12 and then F inverse of pi over 12 would then be, um, so that would just be F would, or F of negative one. Um, so that would be the function that we came up earlier plugging in pi over 12. So it's sine inverse of pi over 12 divided by two. Oh, okay, yeah, so you just plug in the pi of 12 into the earlier, okay. Yep. Okay. Um, which, according to the back of the book, I have not plugged it into my own calculator, um, but according to the back of the book is, um, oh, but because of your domain restrictions, when you plug these in, um, mm -hmm. so for the last one, we got, what was it? I don't even remember already. Uh, for which one? We got one, right? Yeah, one. So one is not within the domain <laughs> restrictions um, because it has to be between zero and pi over two. Wouldn't one be in between those? You because know, pi over two is uh, one point something and one would be less 1. than 5. It should be, yes, but the back of my book is telling me that it's not, which could be another instance of the back of the book being wrong, um, because I would agree that that is a real answer. Oh, sorry. 
it does say one in the back of the book. I misread that. But this answer that we came up, when you try to do this, um, it gives you no real results. Okay. So what would you put down on a test if- Has it, no real solution. Okay. Yeah, because when you do sine inverse of pi divided by 12, um, you get 15 point something divided by two is 7.5, which is not in the domain restrictions. So then you would say um, has no real solution. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lumsden, how could you know uh, if for A, if um, F, and F inverse of X and G inverse of X exist? Um, wait, sorry, can you say it again? For part A, it is asking the, if the functions um, exist. So how do you say that? Um, they, if they exist, they'll be defined for the X values that they give you. So they are well defined is the answer. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how you say it. Like if you can figure out F um, after you've done the, um, the inverse function? Yes. If, so like when we talk about functions, it has to be a continuous line and it can't have two values that would hit a vertical line. Like this that I just drew would not be a function. Mm -hmm. This that I drew would not be a function. But as long as your function is a continuous line, that there's a value, there is one Y value for every X value, then it is a function. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead, knock. Okay, so my part is number five. Sorry, I'm just trying to find. You're good. Okay, so um, we have for A, this is quite simple. So the A for the period, um, we can find it by uh, two pi over, um, so pi over b, which is five mm -hmm. right here, uh, five right here. And for, um, for b, the amplitude is uh, gonna be the front number before sine, so it's six. And um, for, is it six? I think so. Yeah, you're right. Uh, for c, the line of symmetry is actually, um, the, is the middle line, so, um, because there's no like um, there's no number in like after the function, so it should be plus zero. So uh, y equals zero is the midline for a, the function. Uh, okay. And yes, there is a problem with that. Um, you have the right idea, um, and I didn't really cover this very well, so I'm not holding it against you. Obviously, um, when you have a function what you just said is it's symmetrical here but if i were to fold this over then my function would look like this and that is not symmetrical um that would just be a reflection oh. um, and so the symmetry line is actually about the origin so here, if you have, goodness, um, the sine function looking something like that, if you were to rotate it 180 degrees about this dotted line, then it would be the same. Mm -hmm. Because this point, when you rotate it, would become here, and this point would become here. So the, the equation of the line of symmetry is actually y equals x. Okay. Sorry, keep going. Uh, so just note on that is uh, for D, um, so from, from six sine five x to uh, y equals sine x, uh, we're gonna use this transformation like we did in SL. Um, first we have the the amplitude changed by one, uh, one six because, um, you know, um, from six to one six, which you have to, um, from six to one, you have to divide by six to get one, 
for sine x. And second, uh, the period should change um, by um, taking the period from the first one wait, uh, and divided by the period from the second one, which is um, two, pi's, uh, 2 pi over 5 divided by 2 pi over 1. It's, uh, it's going to be um, two, pi, 2 pi over 5 mm, times 1 over 2 pi, and all canceled out to be 1 5. Yes, so the keep in mind, this is this is all right. Um, so the transformation words would be um, stretched by a factor of six. And then um, parallel to the y axis and then stretch by a factor of one fifth on the horizontal. So vertical stretch by six horizontal stretch by one fifth. And that's it. Great job, Nock. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, that was all of the questions other than Jacqueline's. So I will post this video on YouTube. And whenever Jacqueline manages to figure out her problem, whether that's with my help or not, she will post it in the comments section. Or like I will add her video to the comments on Google Classroom. OK. Okay. Um, um, should I this is just a heads up as uh, I feel like I need to be fair and since a couple people already know, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows. Yes, you can stop sharing. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows because that's a fair way. Um, I am going to cut down the questions a little bit more to try to be nice, but tomorrow's test is no calculator. Um, y'all need to get in the habit of doing that and eventually you have to do a minute of mark on the non calculator section as well. I don't want to make you guys cry though, or stress out too much. So I'm going to cut down the questions a lot. Um, so that you have more time because you're not used to not having a calculator yet. Does that sound okay. I mean, not okay because I know y'all hate that but like you got to do it eventually. We got to do it so yeah so tomorrow's test will be all no calculator questions which honestly i'm not kidding guys i think makes this test easier like i know it's harder because you're more likely to make a basic math error but that actually makes the math concepts easier to do like the non-calculator section of the ib test the hardest part about it is can you do algebra not do you know how to math like the calculator section because you have a calculator, they expect you to be able to do algebra. That's where they ask you the most complicated questions. Does that make sense? Fingers crossed. We'll see how it goes, though. If we look at the review and like the classwork questions, or like the questions on the notes. Um, OK, I'm going to look at the test real quick and see if I can answer that question. I haven't really re-looked at the review. Um, there are some questions that are from your classwork, uh, very similar to that, if not even from that, of like, can you plug in a value? Can you find the inverse? Can you do the composite, like the G of F of something? Um, there are a couple questions that ask about domain and range. So once you have an inverse or a composite, how does that affect the range? um let's see more of the f of inverse um there's one where you have to sketch an inverse so it gives you the graph and you have to reflect it i think y'all should be able to do that pretty easily um there is one where it does i think there was one like this on the review where you had to plug in values with the transformations where you're trying to figure out what was the stretch, what was the horizontal shift, what was the vertical shift. Y'all are used to that. Um, yep. So some of it might be looking like it's worded differently. Um, do y'all remember what the axis of symmetry is? Sort of. Kind of. 
Okay, so on a quadratic function, the axis of symmetry is the thing that is the dotted line down the middle. Mm -hmm. So that would be x equals the x coordinate of the vertex. Okay. Um, Sonia had a question, uh, or I think it was on the review, maybe it was on the classwork, where you had to convert from um, standard form of a quadratic to vertex form. And that's in the review video, which is posted on YouTube. Okay. So that, if you know how to do that, you'll be fine. And I think that's it. I haven't decided, I just went through the whole test, air quotes, with you guys. I know I didn't go through it, but I just read through the whole test and told you what was conceptually on it. And I'm planning on taking some of it off. Okay. So it'll probably be the questions that repeat themselves a lot. I'll try to take off. Because if you can prove it to me that you know it once, you don't need to prove it to me that you know it 50,000 times. But again, I'm not, I know this is like maybe not condescending, but maybe not the most reassuring. I'm not worried about your grades on this test because I know that whatever you get, you have an opportunity to remediate as well. I'm more concerned about making sure that y'all are prepared for your IB exams that matter whether or not you get college credit or not. And the better I can prepare you for those, I think that's more useful. It might not feel more useful in the short term, but I promise I'm trying to look out for you in the long term. On my life, I'm not gonna let you fail. Unless you're intentionally trying to fail and then maybe I'll let you fail. <laughs> but if you're putting in the effort, then I'll put in the effort for you, okay? All right. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Yep, I gotta do a half an hour of physics or an hour of physics now because I'm done in physics, so there's that. And I'm tired.